G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today we're going to talk about classification of lubricants for use in the food industry. Might be something that you're familiar with, or maybe not. Maybe you've seen something advertised as food safe, or NSF H1 certified. So we're going to break all that down and see exactly what it means. So let's start with food industry classifications. And it all starts with NSF H1. This is probably something that you've seen before if you've been involved in the food industry at all. Um, if you haven't, we're going to talk about how we got to this place where certain products are NSF H1 registered. We require a little bit of a history lesson. So we're gonna go through where all these different regulations come from. And if you cast your mind into the distant past, you've got to think most people were involved in agriculture. There was just so much energy and it was so labor intensive that most people had exposure to it. These days, with modern farming methods uh, being so productive, most of us are just consumers of food rather than producers as well. And that's down to a lot of mechanization. So where do all these regulations come from? Well, they all kind of have their origin in something called a Codex Alimentarius. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the Codex makes it seem like it's this ancient text or, or maybe it's something from a Warhammer 40k game. The reality is it actually comes from the 60s, I think, with the World Health Organization. Uh, it's, it's often a bit of a risk to talk about the WHO, particularly in a time like this. Uh, they are no stranger to controversy, but they wrote the Codex Alimentarius for a specific purpose. It was actually them and another UN organization to promote the coordination of food standards worldwide across international governments and non-governmental organizations. And if you think about it, um, that makes sense because Production of food happens on the world scale, so we all need to be on the same page. If we are consuming food that was grown, produced, or processed in another country, we would like to think that they are applying the same standards that our own country is. And so that's kind of where this grew up. Now, of course, um, there were numerous conspiracy theories <laughs> that came about because of this. There were ideas back in the 60s when this came into being that uh, the Codex was, was part of an initiative to control the population um, and to put additives into the food system, which would, which would, you know, it's the whole microchip thing, right, all over again. Uh, now, I would say that to those particularly conspiracy theorists back in the 60s, that if that were the objective of the Codex, then it failed spectacularly, because back in 1963, I think the world population was about 3.2 billion, and now we're at about 7.8. So uh, it certainly didn't achieve its objective if, uh, if that was the purpose. But if you think back to 1963, or if you're like me and you weren't alive in 1963, and you can imagine that time, food production has changed greatly since then. So the amount of processed food, for example, has greatly increased and it probably incorporates about 80% of the modern diet. Even uh, what you would call non, well, foods that you don't think of as being processed are highly mechanized. Uh, think of the dairy industry, for example. Everything from milking the cows to then processing the milk and then packaging the milk and then delivering the milk to your door all of that is mechanized now. So we now live in a time where in many ways, the codex has become even more important. And that standardization of food production processes is extremely important. Now, we're gonna go one step further and talk about the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, Section 178.3570. Not a very catchy name and is more commonly referred to just by this designation. Now, what does it do? Well, it's actually the origination of the what we call the 10 part per million rule, where it talked about certain compounds, lubricants are included in those, which can only have an exposure to food of 10 parts per million. So even if, and we're gonna get into this a little bit further, even if you have a food safe lubricant, that doesn't mean that you can, it's edible. 
doesn't mean that uh, you can liberally sprinkle it, sprinkle it on your cornflakes in the morning. You still have to minimize contamination. And so 10 parts per million has remained kind of the rule ever since. One of the reasons it stood the test of time is because no uh, incidents have ever been discovered where the contact was lower than this threshold. So it seems like a, a good enough rule for the moment. But this particular do document gives guidance on specific ingredients that are approved for food contact. And it's not just lubricants. We're talking about all kinds of different chemicals and additives and things like that. And when I say additives, not lubricant additives, sort of food additives. Now, the problem with this is uh, with the 10 ppm rule that this document doesn't really give guidance on uh, how to test that or how to regulate it. So if you are at the Oreo factory and you have made you know, a million Oreos, then it doesn't say, I mean, technically, one of those Oreos could be just pure lubricant, right? And there's no real good way to test for that. Similarly, every single one of the Oreos could have 10 parts per million uh, worth of lubricant in it. And so it didn't, that document doesn't really define any kind of test procedure or how to minimize contamination or anything like that. So a structure in the food industry kind of grew out of how to minimize your risk. And there is a concept in the food industry called HACCP or Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point. Now, if you've been in any of the other industries, it's very similar to HAZID, HAZOP. Um, it's basically an exercise in identifying potential hazards in the manufacturing process and then trying to eliminate them where possible, right? So it's a control measure. And so we're always trying to control contamination. But HACCP is in the food industry predominantly focused on things like pathogens, like salmonella, for example, because they're the ones which could have the biggest consequences for the product down the line. So if people, if there's a large scale uh, uh, food contamination with salmonella, which has happened um, many times, then that's either going to cause a massive product recall, which has economic consequences, or in you know a terrible case, which you don't want to happen, it's going to cause uh, food poisoning of people down the line and potentially deaths. So a lot of HACCP, uh, or has, I'm just going to call it hazard analysis from now on, is focused on uh, specifically on pathogens in the food industry. So now we come to specifically lubricants. And the USDA held uh, this kind of white book because there was no real document that was specific to lubricant technologies. And so they had this white book, which they held from, I think, 1970, where you could register lubricants which were safe um, not safe for use in food, but safe for use around food, if that makes sense. Um, they held this from 1970, but in 1998, they stopped supporting it and an organization called NSF International took it over. Now, the NSF White Book breaks down different categories of lubricant that can be used in the food manufacturing process. So the first one, H1, this is the most famous. This is lubricant that's acceptable for incidental food contact. Remember, incidental. So you can't just splash the lubricant in. It's got to be incidental food contact. H2 is lubricant where no food contact is permissible. Now, you might say, well, what's the point of that classification? It's basically an exercise so that in your hazard analysis, you can define areas of a plant where is it possible for the lubricant to get into the uh, food production system by means of a leak or something like that? Or are there areas of the plant where that's just not possible, right? So if there are areas of the plant where that's just not possible, then theoretically you can use any lubricant because if it's impossible that it could contaminate the food, then you can use anything else. And that would be a H2 classed area. Then you've got similar categories for heat transfer fluids. And then there's an H3 and a confusingly a 3H where H3 is soluble oil that needs to be cleaned before service. So what would that be? Maybe a, a rust inhibitor for a meat hook, as an example. So while the meat hook is in storage, you have an oil that covers it, which prevents rust, but that needs to be removed before you put it in use and hang meat on that hook. 
And then finally, there's 3H, which is very confusingly named, which are release agents that prevent adhesion of products. So that would be used on things like cutting boards to prevent meat from sticking to the cutting board. So obviously that's in direct contact with, uh, with food and therefore usually it's some kind of edible oil, right? So derived from plant or animal products. All right. Now let's talk specifically about H1 lubricants because they're sort of the most important as far as we're concerned. Now remember, acceptable for incidental food contact, the 10 part per million rule is still in place. So again, your hazard analysis should be doing everything in your power to minimize the amount of contact with food. Um, and you can only say that something is NSF H1 registered if the product is listed in the white book. So I've seen uh, various products over the years that are labeled food safe when they're not necessarily NSF H1 registered or certified. Uh, so that's something to look out for. One of the other things that's been really interesting is I've seen a lot of uh, uh, lithium greases which are labeled as food safe. And lithium as a thickener, to my knowledge, is never considered food safe. So again, something to watch out for. Uh, generally, uh, food safe greases are made from an, like an aluminium complex or a polyurea uh, base. Um, there are also subcategories within H1. So HX1, for example, relates to lubricant additives which have been identified as safe for use in finished lubricants in certain proportions. Now, why would such a list exist? It just makes it easier for formulators to be able to pick and choose lubricants which are going to be in a finished lubricant and food safe. Right? Now, there is a bit of a perception out there that uh, food safe lubricants are not very good, right? Not very good in terms of machinery preservation. Let's address that because modern day uh, food safe lubricants, uh, let's split them up into mineral and synthetic oil. So if it's a mineral oil, it's usually gonna be a white oil. And if it's a synthetic oil, it's usually gonna be a PAO or a PAG. And you know, PAOs and PAGs, as we know, have exceptional lubricating properties. So just because something is a food safe lubricant or NSF H1 certified, uh, shouldn't mean that you will get poor performance out of it. Now, there is one more layer to this, which is the ISO 21469 lubricant standard. This you can kind of think of as the HACCP, but for the food safe lubrication manufacturing process. So it's kind of like, okay, you can say that uh, a product is NSF H1 certified because it's gone through the certification process and the NSF board has been able to determine that all the components in uh, the lubricant base oil and additive package, you know, combined makes for a food safe package. But how, how has the manufacturer of that product ensured that its product is going to be food safe all the time? So this is kind of like an auditing, uh, it's voluntary, by the way, it's not mandatory, uh, a, a voluntary system by which manufacturers can sign up to and you know the formulations are reviewed the labels are reviewed they do risk assessments production facility audits are conducted uh, and they do testing of the products and all that kind of stuff to ensure that the food grade lubricant manufacturers are always meeting their own standards so whole nother kettle of fish uh, now we haven't even talked about um, this is where I'm going to finish up the video, but we haven't even talked about things like kosher and halal certification, which is hugely important, even if you don't live, let's say, for example, in a Muslim majority country or a, uh, or, or any other kind of uh, religious majority, because usually they are part of your addressable market. So I live in Australia, for example, um, and there is, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but off the top of my head, I would say that at least 10% of the Australian population is Muslim. So um, it's just poor business to not address that market. And so you need to be looking at lubricants that are produced in a halal certified manner. Layer on top of this is that there are also local regulations. So again, I can speak to my experience in Australia and New Zealand. There are 
also separate registrations for products in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so you need to go to the government organizations and have your product registered with them as well for use in the food industry. All right, I know that was a lot, um, but really important to, to make sure that everyone is aware of exactly what these different certification systems are and different ISO standards are and kind of where they came from. And I think the most important takeaway from this one is just because something is a food safe lubricant doesn't mean that it is edible. All right, this has been Lubrication Explained.